A very warm welcome to the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show. And today's show is Manchester United to the Football Fun Factory, which captures the life of a former English Premier League player for Manchester United. An English retired professional football player who played as a midfielder, started his career at Manchester United, where he made 25 Premier League appearances in four seasons, winning the Premier League title, of course, and a medal in season 2000 and 2001. While at Old Trafford, he spent time out on loan at Reading and Burnley before joining West Ham United on a permanent basis in the summer of 2004. A year later, he joined Stoke City on loan before making the move permanent in January 2006. He remained at Stoke City until November 2006, making 55 appearances before joining Norwich City. Of course, a local club to me here in Norfolk. Injuries, however, restricted his time at Carrow Road and he moved to Milton Keynes Dons in October 2008. In March 2014, he joined his hometown club, Cambridge United, the club he supported as a child. He also made... 13 appearances for England under 21s. He is currently a key figure at the Football Fun Factory, which teaches boys and girls of all ages football, teamwork, and how to play the game, which may one day produce a future England men's and ladies team captain. I certainly hope so. Yes, folks, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome on the show Luke Chadwick. Welcome to the show, Luke. Thank you, Lord Russell. And what an incredible intro that was. Thank <laughs> you so much. Oh, that's OK. A bit long, as I said earlier. But, um, you know, when 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 someone like yourself is on the show, we've got to make sure we give you the, the right traction. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Um, Luke, to start from the beginning, you were born and grew up in Cambridge and you initially had a three week trial at your favourite club, Cambridge United, at the tender age of 10. But this didn't come to anything. And after a spell at Arsenal, you signed up to Manchester United Youth System. So straight into the youth training system at one of England's top Premier League football clubs. So please tell us more about why Cambridge United and Arsenal didn't see what Manchester United did see in your potential as a player. Yeah, it could have been also also different in them sort of early years. So I started playing football at the age of eight years old for my first grassroots team, which was called Melbourne Tigers. Still got incredible memories of those days, a little village just to the um, to the south of Cambridge and done incredibly well, scored a lot of goals. I was freakishly fast as a young boy and we used to go straight in back then onto a full-size pitch with full-size goals and my teammates used to smash the ball over the top. I'd chase after it and whack the ball in the massive goal of, in past the, the tiny little goalkeeper. So I got quite a reputation at a, a young age of being a talented footballer, which led into the the trial at Cambridge United, the team that I loved, the team that I supported. I went there to, and trained for about three weeks and things didn't work out and they told me not to not to bother coming back. As a 10-year-old boy, that was obviously heartbreaking. But oh, devastating. Yeah, devastating, particularly because it was my club as well, but carried on playing, of course, and then went to Arsenal as an under-13 player, which saw me going there once a week to train at Highbury. There was an indoor centre at Highbury where we used to train and then play for them on a Sunday within their School of Excellence. On a Saturday morning, I'd play for the Cambridge Schools team where, again, I'd scored a lot of goals. And that's where Manchester United first heard of me and sent a scout to watch me. And then that resulted in me going up for a trial, went up for a trial for a week during the school holidays and absolutely fell in love with a place and was absolutely delighted when they signed me as a schoolboy. I don't think Arsenal were particularly happy when I left them to go to Manchester United, but I, <laughs> I made my mind up and the, the rest is, is history. From So from the age of sort of 14 years old, I was a, a Manchester United player. I used to travel up there while I was still at school on a Friday morning and come home on a Sunday. So I got Friday off school, which was always nice as a 15, oh. 16 year old boy and then when I left school at 16 I moved up there to begin my my YTS my youth training scheme so that was the sort of journey that I went on as a child that took me to Manchester United. 
And what a journey that is, too. And, of course, to have Fridays off at school, well, that's pleasurable, isn't it? It really is. It's uh, something we all wish for as a child, I think, to be honest. Because uh, I always remember Fridays at school being a day when you always had spelling tests and math tests and all this kind of thing. You know, to take Fridays off was brilliant, wasn't it? <laughs> Pain it was, illness, but it in your was case. nice to, um, to miss, a, miss a day off school. Absolutely. I could quite agree with that, Luke. And you made your professional debut for Manchester United uh, on the 13th of October 1999 in the third round of the League Cup as a young United side lost 3-0 to Aston Villa. So so how was your debut, uh, Luke? Any moments, uh, albeit in a youthful losing Manchester, Manchester United side that day, any moments you remember in particular? Yeah, I think probably the biggest memory I've got is the day before when we found out a lot of a lot of us young players at the time, we turned up to, to training at the cliff to be told we'd be training with the first team that day and we found out that we'd be starting the game the next day. Obviously, as a, a young player, it was a, a dream come true, walking back to my digs from the cliff, uh, just thinking, I've, I've made it, I've done what I always dreamed to do, I'm going to play for Manchester United. Obviously, we... We went down to Villa Park, as you allude to there, as quite a young team against a really experienced Aston Villa team and were, were well beaten on the day. I think even though we were beaten, never liked losing, but came off the pitch absolutely still buzzing inside that I'd played a proper game of football in front of thousands of fans. I remember oh. sitting in the dressing room after the game and the manager, Sir Alex Ferguson, sort of, gave us a bit of a dressing down because it was unacceptable, regardless of our age, to to lose a game like that. But sort of looking at the floor, trying not to to smile purely for the fact that I played a game for Manchester United. It couldn't couldn't get any better than that, regardless of the fact we'd unfortunately unfortunately got beaten. So it was um a wonderful memory to um to make my debut for the club. Yeah, you must have been pinching yourself. You really must have been, because that's such a... It's almost a dream, isn't it, really, Luke? You know, a dream that, that's come true. You must be pinching yourself One, is this really happening? Because <laughs> 100%. You know, 100%, 100%. I think um, to a bit of a strange moment in the game, one of my big heroes growing up was Dion Dublin, who obviously mm. was a young player at Cambridge United before having an incredible career in the game, but he was playing for... Aston Villa that night so to be on the same pitch as him so close to him really made it even more special the fact that we were that I was playing in a in a first team game that's incredible isn't it and of course your debut season was the season after Manchester United had won the then famous treble uh, going back and uh, of the Premier League of course FA Cup Champions League and with all those great players too, you know, that included the homegrown nucleus of Ryan Giggs, David Beckham, Paul Scholes, Gary Neville, Phil Neville and Nicky Buck, to name just a few, of course, who all took took on more prominent roles in the squad. I mean, what was it like to be part of this fantastic Manche- Manchester United team, Luke? I mean, how did it feel emotionally as a, as a young player with all those top stars around you, potential top, you know, top stars? Amazing. Yeah, I think the, the class of 92 were always... A great inspiration for the for us younger players that were at the club. Obviously, seeing what they were doing, seeing what they achieved were achieving, made it feel sort of real that players that were in our position just a few years previous were now really important players within the first team. I think in my sort of own personal experience, I was an incredibly sort of quiet, shy, introverted young man and found it quite hard to integrate and maybe felt a little bit out my depth when training with these sort of superstars of the game it took, <laughs> yes. took a, a little while to to get used to it in my case I went out on loan to to Royal Antwerp in Belgium for a period of time to get some first team experience and then when I came back I was in the squad which I was quite surprised about and sort of traveling here there and everywhere with these incredible players I think I learned very quickly that the environment and culture was very different in the first team squad than what I was used to at Antwerp. I remember my first training session and giving the ball away a couple of times and getting told in no uncertain terms by Roy Keane, the captain, that, <laughs> that was unacceptable. And I sort of had to liven up very quickly and was sort of thinking, like, what this is, this isn't what I was really expecting. But then after the training session, Roy pulling me to one side and sort of explaining exactly why he did it and the way that he'd do that, whether it was me, a young player coming through or a seasoned professional like Andy Cole or Ryan Giggs, he'd say the same to them because the standards 
had to be incredibly high to to win the games on the Saturday and win the trophies that the club were were winning at that time. Absolutely. And I think Bobby Charlton was like that going back, wasn't it, as well? He 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 was very much somebody as a player for Manchester United who who didn't accept defeat, didn't accept losing the ball, always wanted the ball. And if a player didn't pass the ball to Bobby Charlton, took a shot, he'd have a go. Why didn't you pass the ball to me? You know, because that was what he wanted, to total, total um, football and, and, and that win, winning mentality, which is obviously driven through the Manchester United side for many, many years. Probably from the Busby Babes days, to be fair. Um, and all the way through from then. I mean, it's a fantastic uh, achievement, isn't it, really? What a oh, club. Yeah. Without a doubt. I think Bobby Charlton was a, a hugely influential figure at the club mm. while I was there. And it was sort of... Yeah, bless him. In bless the dressing room, that debut that you spoke about at Aston Villa, he was in the dressing room after the game and he was after every game. And someone that just demanded respect and that history and culture, as you say there, that came from the... The, the great Busby Babes team and sort of continued through time. And obviously Sir Alex sort of took up that mantle and done his own way of bringing the young players through and like the class of 92. And I think that's what the, the club was built around, that history and that tradition. Absolutely. And you could hardly say that the class of 92 was better than the Busby Babes, although the Busby Babes, of course, because of that tragic uh, Munich disaster, never got to prove how good they could have been. So, you know, it's an arguable comment from me, really, isn't it? But uh, amazing side that you were part of. But, you know, what was it like on the training ground? I mean, being part of this great team uh, must have must have been incredible with all those personalities and ego, egos. What was the training ground like? Yeah, it was an incredibly sort of intense environment. Like I say, the, the culture there was, of course, everyone wanted to win. I'd probably say that training was just as hard as the games. There was no <laughs> sort of anyone taking it easy. And myself as very much a squad player who would come on and play at some games, start the odd games, that meant that I'd usually train in every session. So come the end of the season, I remember as a young player, I was absolutely exhausted, both obviously physically from having my first season in and around the squad like that, but also emotionally from getting up every morning and knowing I've got to be on it and work as hard as I possibly can in every training session. It was without doubt, a, like, a, of course, an amazing an experience and something that I learned so much from probably just as much in terms of life lessons and football lessons of what was expected to be at that club at that yes. time in terms of being humble with, with what you are and what you were doing and what the team was achieving, that how important the hard work was how important it was to show respect to your teammates and others. So it was really incredible lessons that you probably don't realise as a 18, 19 year old boy you're learning, but on reflection, it was um, a great, yes. great learning experience. And a great experience, you just say, Luke, too. I mean, wonderful stuff. I mean, we've we've heard many stories about the hairdryer moments with Sir Alex Ferguson. Great manager, absolutely incredible. But what was Sir Alex truly like in training? Plus, of course, before, during, and after games, we've all heard and read about the football uh, boot moment with David Beckham, of course. <laughs> but that aside, do you have any memories of pre- and post-match Sir Alex Ferguson moments you could share with us? Uh, I'm sure you've experienced some colourful dressing room incidents with Sir Alex. Must be some wonderful memories there, I'm sure. Yeah, I think like with with the manager, it was like the way that he treated people was without doubt. The way that he could build relationships was a huge yeah. reason around the club's success. So. He, he ran the club from top to bottom. He knew everyone. He treated the the dinner ladies, the kit men with the same respect. He'd treat Roy Keane or yeah. Teddy Sheeran and big superstars. And it was, everyone was pulling together in the same direction in terms of, because, because of him really, because of the club and because of Sir Alex. And you, there was no better feeling than getting praise from the manager. And when you got a telling off, it was obviously scary that he was shouting at you a fearsome character, but the the worst thing was was the feeling that you'd you'd let him down because he was a one person you didn't want to let down. He would like as a I spoke about earlier as a fourteen year old boy. I went up for a trial. When I came back from the trial, as soon as I got home, my mum picked me up from the station and told me that she had a phone call that afternoon from Sir Alex saying that. He wanted me to sign for the club. And they were the little details that you just wanted to work as hard as you possibly could for him because of what he'd do and how he'd make you feel special. So I think in terms of 
training, he never took a huge part in training. It was the coaches. He always had fantastic coaches with him, of course, Brian Kidd, Steve McLaren, Carlos Quiros. Yes. Throughout his time there, he had brilliant coaches, but he had a a sort of aura about him where obviously the training sessions were incredibly intense, but sometimes you'd start the training and Sir Alex was still in the office doing some other sort of work that he'd doing, but you just knew the second he'd come out on the pitch because the tempo rose an extra five, ten percent because everyone wanted to impress him when he was out there. So I think it was sort of on a game day, like it, it was always inspirational what he'd what he'd say, but again, it was more about hu- the human side of it, more so than real in-depth technical information that he'd give or sort of tactics on the other team. It was always about sort of that heart and desire that would be required to to win a game of football. So I think like the the man was obviously has left an incredible legacy on the club and was a, a huge inspiration mm. to, to everyone that worked under him. Without doubt, absolute icon of football, Sir Alex Ferguson. Without doubt, absolute gentleman. I mean, is it true, you know, I've read these stories as well, that particularly when Manchester United were playing Chelsea, for example, that Sir Alex Ferguson and Jose Mourinho would share a glass of fine red wine after the match? Is that a true story? I, I, I hope think, it is. I think the manager was renowned for sharing good wine with every manager that he played <laughs> against. So was it, he had his little office at Old Trafford and I think he... Wonderful. And I think when you, you hear it, obviously I wasn't privy and being around that and being in the manager's office, but I think you listen to a huge amount of managers that came into the role new and Sir Alex was always someone that would help them and offer them advice. And I think that as to us, us players, he was a huge inspiration. I think also to... His peers of managers of other clubs also held him in that that same esteem. Absolutely. Great man. And after loan, loans, as you've already mentioned, at, at Royal Antwerp in Belgium, uh, you made your, your Premier League debut for Manchester United on November in November 2000 in a 2-1 home win over Middlesbrough. Uh, as a, an added as an added time substitute for Dwight Walk, you came on as a as a sub for Dwight Walk. How did that feel walking onto the famous Old Trafford pitch? I mean, let's be honest, in front of a fallen expectant Manchester United fan base. I mean, the theatre of dreams and your dreams started to come true as a top professional player. Your first Premier League match on the on the hello turf of Old Trafford. Yeah, oh, incredible. Yeah, it, it certainly was. I think it was. Um... Like like you say, I came on in injury time. I remember sort of taking my tracksuit off and standing by the side of the pitch waiting to go on and the ball didn't seem like it was going to go out of play and I thought the final whistle was going to blow without <laughs> me actually getting the opportunity to come on. But I remember sort of coming on and you can sort of see all them people. Obviously, I think, like you say, Dwight York came off and got a huge round of applause from the, from the old Trafford crowd and sort of going onto that pitch, you can just feel the... The adrenaline. I think I've played for about ninety seconds before the full time whistle went. Ran around like a headless chicken, and when the whistle went, it just felt such a, a buzz. I remember walking through the tunnel, and I just you sort of felt part of of the team, as it were. You didn't definitely do a huge amount to get the win. You played for ninety seconds, but you just to play a Premier League game, you just felt part part of something incredibly special. Absolutely. And to have 60-odd thousand eyes on you as well when you're walking onto the pitch, plus, you know, TV cameras and the rest of the, the footballing world watching on, probably. That's some experience, isn't it, Luke? It really is. Great feeling to have. A great yeah, chance. At, at that age as well, you've got sort of the, you'd never experienced it before. It's that innocent of youth. You probably didn't feel a, a huge amount of pressure. Of course, you had nerves and a huge amount of excitement but it was um like if you could bottle that feeling that you have from doing that I think you could make a large amount of money that's for sure absolutely and then in December 2000 you came on in the 80th minute again as a substitute for Dennis Irwin at home and I dare say this is the old enemy Liverpool and was sent off in the 88th minute for a foul on Vladimir Smyso in a 1-0 defeat at Old Trafford Liverpool had cleared another attack, I understand, and the ball fell to Vladimir Smyth, who broke forward from his own own half beyond United's last line of defence. You clung on to the Czech international and eventually brought him down on the edge of the area. Referee Mike Riley saw no option but to send you off. So what do you remember about that instant, Luke, and how did Sir Alex Ferguson react as well? 
because that's something, isn't it? Yeah, not a penalty, but I remember it very well. I, I obviously, <laughs> we we were chasing the game at the time. I don't yeah. really understand why I was the last man. I remember sort of getting in the situation. It was quite a strange sort of incident, really, because. We were both at like Smith's had old and my shirt, and I was sort of going along with him. I can obviously completely yeah. understand why the, the referee sent me off. He, when I sort of looked up after he blew, blew his whistle, it looked like he couldn't wait to get that red card out. And I remember oh. not, I didn't really know what to do because you can't go back on the, the bench after being set off, sent off. So it was up the other end of the furthest away from the Stretford end. So I had to walk all the way down the pitch, down the tunnel. It was quite a strange feeling, really, because the the fans gave me a really good round of applause as I walked off, and I didn't know what to do because I mm. thought I'm in massive trouble here. I didn't know whether to sort of smile or cry, really, the situation was in. And I remember going back in and sitting down in the, the dressing room thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to get a, the biggest telling off of, of my life in about five minutes' time. And I remember yeah. Yap Stam came in the dressing room, so I think he was injured. And said, well, what's wrong? Are you injured? And I said, no, no, I've been sent off. And he looked a bit surprised because I weren't the type of player that would get sent off for, for doing a bad tackle or arguing with a referee or anything like that. And I just sat mm. there. And it's probably the longest sort of five, ten minutes of my life waiting for the, the players to come back in. When the players come back in, I think a few of them said to me, that don't worry about it. There's not much else you could have done, which sort of, made me feel a little bit better. But the yes. big worry was obviously the manager and what he'd say. <laughs> but I, he actually didn't say a word about it. He was so angry about the performance and the result that I got away with it. So I was incredibly fortunate when I got back in the, the car and got myself home, but obviously very disappointed to, like you say, lose to the to the enemy in Liverpool. Yeah, absolutely. And that would have been, obviously, so Alex Ferguson's main thing, wasn't it? Losing at home to Liverpool. Regardless of what happened to yourself, you know, as a midfielder, last man, that's crazy, isn't it? But you were, it happened. You were sent off and it was all part of the game, isn't it, really? Yeah, I remember sort of that that was over the Christmas period and yes. I, was, um, I was suspended for the game on New Year's Day, which was against West Ham. And I was sort of living up in Manchester, obviously, and I was I asked if I could go home for the for the new year because I wouldn't be able to play. And the club didn't realise that I was suspended for that game because the manager said he was going to play me right wing because Stuart Pearce was playing left back for West Ham and he thought that I might be able to run at him a little bit because he was getting a yeah. bit older. So that I was absolutely gutted because I would have started the game, but because of the suspension, it it, it never happened. Oh, that's a shame. And you yeah. could have pitched yourself up with your pace and speed against uh, Stuart Pearce as well, wouldn't you? And that would have been quite a nice little duel, I, I should imagine, with Pearce's reputation. That would have been a lovely little duel, I'm sure. Yeah, but I probably would have got happen. a couple of, um, couple of kicks, that's for sure, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, you, you would have had a few bruises. That's, there's no doubt about that. Uh, you did make uh, 25 appearances uh, in your time at Manchester United and in doing so scored two Premier League goals as well in the title winning uh, 2001 season. Uh, one in a 3 0 win at Bradford City and the other in a 1 1 draw at Leeds United. So, two away goals, Luke, which is always a good, it's always good to silence the home crowd, isn't it? So, please tell us more about those, you know, these two goals and which one you remember the most. Yeah, I think probably the the Leeds one because it was such um, a fierce rivalry to score at Ellen Road was great. The yes. Bradford one, I remember. I mean, I, I, they were both great memories. But the Bradford one, we were playing really poorly. I remember that at the dressing room at half time because Ryan Giggs and Roy Keane had a bit of a bit of an argument in the dressing room, and then. 15 minutes into the second half, I came on as sub, and Gary Walsh, who was in goal for Bradford, a former Manchester United player, made a a really bad mistake with a ball at his feet and it ended up at Teddy Sheringham's feet with an empty net. He made it 1-0 then. I um, made a run through the middle and David Beckham picked me out with a with a lovely pass and I managed to stick it away with the old swinger, the left foot, where it wasn't <laughs> always that reliable. And I didn't when I scored that goal, that was my first goal, I didn't really know what to do. I started running towards the crowd and then turned back, saw my teammates, they embraced me and it was an amazing feeling. With the the Leeds goal, it was a probably wasn't as good a goal, but uh, it was a really intense atmosphere. I was on the bench again. I remember getting quite a lot of 
stick warming up on the side of the pitch at Ellen Road from the Leeds fans and then coming <laughs> on and Oli Gunnar Solskjaer getting sent through by Paul Scholes and had a really weak shot for his sort of ability to shoot the ball. And Nigel Martin, one of the best goalkeepers in the Premier League at the time, spilt it and I couldn't believe my luck that I was right in front of goal oh. and tapped it in and it was a great feeling. The only sort of biggest regret was that that might put us 1-0 up, but then late in the game, Mark Viduka equalised to make it 1-1. So I was gutted that I didn't score the, the, the winning, winning goal. goal in a Leeds-Man United game. Yeah, and of course, you say you didn't know what to do when you first you, you, you scored your first goal. Because um, a lot of players have their, their, their goal-scoring antics, don't they? Their celebrations already wrapped up. I mean... Some players years ago, I mean, the Alan Shearer, for example, was always his arm up, wasn't he? He'd wheel away with his arm up and he'd run out to the corner post, you know, standard sort of uh, celebration. But you'd say you didn't have anything. You didn't have anything you'd practised at all before before you scored goals at Manchester United or, uh, you know, as a as a youngster? What was no, your... no, I think as a, as a young player, sort of a kid growing up, I used yeah. to sort of copy the ones on the TV. I remember <laughs> the, the Roger Miller sort yes. of wiggle in the corner flag, the old Sharpie shuffle, that type of thing. But I think yeah. when it got to the professional level and scoring a goal was always such a, a great buzz that I didn't have anything sort of planned and the emotion just sort of took over and just run off like um, like with the arm in the air. Yeah, just soak up the atmosphere, soak up the crowd, the, the supporters, the admiration, you know. Oh, I've scored, fantastic. Brilliant. And of course, your teammates all smiling. So Alex on the sidelines, happy. You know, that's good, isn't it, really? Oh, 100%. 100%. Brilliant. And of course, not forgetting, of course, winning the Premier League winner's medal too for 2000 and 2001 season. I mean, how did that feel at the, at the time, Luke? You must have been over the moon. A Premier League winner's medal. Yeah, it was um, like a strange feeling, really, in terms of, like, you know, as a young player, you've not, played a huge part in the team winning it. You're sort of there with the team. You've got your medal. It's, I think it's something sort of as a young player, in my case anyway, where I probably didn't appreciate it at the time as much as like the, the bigger deal that it was. I think looking back now, it's sort of a case of, I can't believe that I won a, a Premier League winner's medal sort of back then. But it was obviously to be part of that squad. Oh, like one yes. of the, the best squads that the, the Premier League seen was, was very special. And to... To have the medal was something that I'm, that I'm inc- of course, incredibly proud of. Absolutely. I mean, you were, without doubt, part of one of the finest Manchester United sides to have ever been put together. Let's be honest. You were. Yeah, you were always, always feels a bit sort of funny when people sort of say that. I think sort of I've, I've never been one to sort of blow my own trumpet, as it were, and I, I, to... Like, it, for me, even for me to look back now and to have been part of that squad is something that, that I can't quite believe. But again, something I'm very grateful for. And of course, good friends with all those great players as well, I should imagine. You're still still pally and still have social evenings and days and stuff times with them, I guess, do you? Let's be honest, you know, the likes of David Beckham. I mean, he's a mega star, isn't he? Um, and uh, so to have him as a friend in your in your mobile phone list must be something special. No, I think to like to have had them teammates. I think football's um like a strange industry in terms of you sort of go from team to team and you can be like sort of ships in the night. You'll be a yeah. teammate of someone and you won't see them again for, for 15 years. But I think you've always got that camaraderie, as it were, of people that you've played football with, people that you've sort of shared a dressing room with. You can sort of pick up that immediately when you see them again. Gosh, you can. That's what it's all about, isn't it? It's wonderful, really. And in your your time at Manchester United from 1999 to 2004, you did have some loan spells. We've already mentioned Royal Antwerp, of course, in Belgium, where you made 26 appearances and scored seven goals. So it's no no mean feat. There must have been some experience playing in Europe too, uh, Luke. And and did it improve your game overall when you yeah, come I mean, back to Manchester United? It, it was um, like a brilliant experience, both in terms of football and sort of life life experience as well of going to live and play in a different country. I think when I went out to, to Royal Antwerp on loan, I wasn't doing that well at Man United. I think they expected me to be sort of closer to the first team than what I was at the time. And going out there gave me the opportunity to play first team football for the first time in my career. I've sort of started really well, scored a goal. The fans really took to me they, when I'd be the first time I was playing in the game and the uh, the fans would sing my name, which gave me 
so much confidence oh. to, to sort of hear that. And I think what Antwerp gave to me was the experience of playing first team football and a huge amount of confidence to then go back to, to Manchester. When I went back to Manchester, I wasn't really expecting to go straight back into the first team squad. So I was quite surprised when that happened. But the the confidence that I developed at Antwerp saw me be able to to make an impact within the training sessions and get selected for the first team squad at United. Wonder what's fantastic, isn't it? And then, of course, in 2003, you had two loan spells at uh, First Division Reading with 15 appearances overall. And and it is said as well that I've read this that you were inspired by, by Arsenal's Matthew Upson, uh, who increased his standing in the game by making the same move. I mean, that's 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 incredible, isn't it? Yeah, I think Matty Upson went there and done brilliantly well he did. in the first half of the season. Then I went to uh, to Reading in the second half of the season. I think my spells out on loan at, when I went to Reading and went to Burnley, I knew by that stage that there wasn't a sort of pathway for me at Manchester United. I knew that I'd be moving on and that was the opportunity to to gain some experience and look to to find a different way in my journey that I knew wouldn't be at, at Manchester United. Absolutely, and we'll come on to that. And of course, your 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 debut for for the Royals, uh, Reading. You scored the equaliser in a two one home win over Gillingham. Your initial uh, one month loan deal was extended until the end of the season in two thousand and three, where you helped Reading to the playoff semi finals. Sadly, of course, Reading were knocked out by eventual uh, promoted Wolverhampton Wanderers. So, how was this experience, Luke? You know, playing all the way through to those. Wonderful little experiences of playoff semis and finals. I mean, that's a, a traumatic experience, isn't it, really? That, yeah, obviously, it's always so. So it's happened to me a few times throughout my yes. career, even in the, in the playoffs, in the semi finals. I think that Reading was, of course, very different to, to Manchester United in terms of facilities, standards, and everything like that. But something that I sort of really enjoyed, I enjoyed the fact that I was obviously closer to the first team. I was playing most weeks while I was there and sort of maybe not being so much under the microscope that, that obviously comes with playing for one of the biggest clubs in the world at Manchester United and probably felt a little bit more relaxed there and sort of in understanding that this was probably going to be my career now. It wasn't going to be at the the very top, top level of a Manchester United and a Champions League team. It was going to be sort of in the championship and that was sort of what Something that I was excited about, to be honest. Absolutely, and, and, and no, and there's no, no problem with that either. I mean, and then in 2003, you were loaned out as well for the season to First Division Burnley. And um, this is while the, the Premiership was a Premiership because it's still the first, second, and third divisions, wasn't it? Until it got renamed to the Championship, League One and League Two. But you were you were sent out to First Division Burnley, but you missed pre-season due to to jaw operations as part of your two-year treatment plan. However, in 40 games you scored six goals including two and a four nil win over Bradford and after the game you eventually conceded but you may have to leave Manchester United I mean this is a big decision Luke isn't it uh but you've kind of intimated this already on on the show but oh wow what a decision yeah I think it like on that it was like when I I played for the season the 2000-2001 season where I had some success I played in a few games was lucky enough to to get a Premier League winner's medal. I think the next season I suffered with a few injuries. And when I came back, I, the, the biggest part of my game, the biggest strength of my game was the ability to, to run incredibly fast with or without mm. ball. That's where I had an impact. I think I lost a little bit of that and didn't have the same impact. And I could recognise that. And of course, the club could recognise that as well. So the manager had a really honest conversation with me and said, like, without that electrifying pace, you're not going to, have a career at Manchester United, it's going to be tough to have a career right at the, the top level of the game, which of course is hard to hear. But at the same time, I appreciated mm. the honesty and sort of knew then that this is what it's going to look very different. It's not going to be at Manchester United. So I had the loan at Reading come back to the club and then the, the manager said that his mate Stan Turner wanted to take me to Burnley on loan and I was sort of more than happy to do so and really enjoyed my, my season at Burnley. Absolutely right. And uh, you look back on your time at Manchester United, you're from a young lad, let's be honest, you were there for a long time. 
Um, what do you remember most about your time at Manchester United? I mean, apart from the, the Premier League appearances and all that wonderful stuff, what else do you remember about the club itself and, you know, your stay there, your tenure at such a great club? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, the memories that I've got are hugely positive. I think everything mm. that the sort of the club is, what the club stands for, taught me so many lessons in terms of sort of the rest of my football career and post football career. The, the, the best memories are probably them ones as a as a kid when you're going away on sort of tours that YTS period where you've just left school and you're just playing football every day, doing something that you love doing, living in digs. They were. Like incredible memories, of course, and having the opportunity to be in around the first team. I mean, it was um, like an amazing, amazing experience. Of course, there were massive challenges as well along the way, but that's sort of part and parcel of of playing football or in any walk of life. There, there's always challenges. Well, without doubt, without doubt. Life is very challenging at times, I can assure you. <laughs> it's, uh, we're, we're all full of moments in life, aren't we, really? But it's how, it's how we become what we are. You know, we learn from those moments, don't we? And it makes us the man or the woman that we are today, let's be honest. That's yeah. life. And in 2004, you made a permanent move to West Ham United of the newly renamed Championship, of course, then, on a free transfer. You were signed by Alan Pardew, who had managed you at Reading, I and mean, how was your time at West Ham United and how did your time at West Ham United compare to Manchester United? Because West Ham's a great club, isn't it? Fantastic yeah. history. Yeah, West Ham's a, a massive club. I was <clears throat> absolutely delighted to, to sign for West Ham. I think I, I went back after my season at Burnley. I thought I'd find a club and be away, but I ended up going back to Manchester United for pre-season and actually travelled on the, the pre-season trip to America and it was out there that I heard that West Ham had come in for me and wanted to to sign me. So I went straight down there and sort of knew Alan from the, my time at Reading and was delighted to sign for such a big club in terms of what West Ham was. It was a season that I thoroughly enjoyed. Again, probably in and out the team to a certain extent. Had some really good games, some really poor games, just yes. a normal season really. But And it was resulted in us going up in the playoffs where when when I got there, I think we were expected to go up automatically because we had a brilliant squad for the championship, the likes of sort of Teddy Sheringham, mm. Matty Everington, Bobby Zamora, Marlon Harrod, like really, really good players. So I think it was not expected that we'd end up in the playoffs, but to, to go up in the playoffs was was massive for the club and so, so important considering the season before they lost in the playoff final to to Crystal Palace. So it was it was brilliant for the club to get promoted to the Premier League. Probably not the best news for me because that meant they went out and signed a load of <laughs> players, some fantastic players, which meant I was surplus to requirements and was on the on the move again. Absolutely. And so for the next 10 years, starting in 2005, uh, you had spells at Stoke City, my a local club to me here, of course, Norwich City, MK Dons and your home club, Cambridge United. You spent some six years at MK Dons, firstly on loan from Norwich City and then a, a permanent deal. Arguably, you could say, uh, Luke, that uh, your best days were at Milton Keynes Dons in this period as a player. Uh, and you were named MK Dons Player of the Season in 2009-10 and 2010-11. Uh, Please tell us more about your times as a football, and I'll say this loosely, football journeyman at this time from 2005 and the moments that you, you can remember fondly. I mean, MK Don's played the season twice. That's, a, that's yeah. amazing. No, yeah, I think like during that time, I moved from West Ham, said that I, were, I wasn't going to be sort of part of the squad in the Premier League and it was up to me whether I moved on or not. And Stoke wanted to take me on loan, so I went up to Stoke, ended up signing... Permanently, we, we, me and my wife and I had a young family and probably didn't settle as we would have wanted. So wanted to come back down south and was absolutely buzzing when I signed for Norwich. It was a, a massive club, not far away from home. Mm. Couldn't wait to, to start that journey. I played in my first game, my debut against Ipswich in the, the big derby game. Scored a goal, well, one nil up. The fans were singing my name, thinking this is absolutely perfect. Then it turned a little bit sour at the towards the end of the game, picked up a really horrible knee injury which oh. resulted in me being out for about nine months. Norwich still signed me. They kept my word. Incredible football club that treated yes. me so well, but could never 
get myself fit. It just didn't seem to work for me at Norwich. And that's when I ended up going to MK Dons. And like you say, it was when I was most settled both on and off the pitch. I was living at home. It was a lovely place for my family, my wife, my children to come and watch me play football. And it was just a a good club, the right club for me at the right time. The chairman was a a fantastic guy, worked under some brilliant managers in Mm. Roberto Di Matteo, Paul Ince, who was a big hero of mine, sort of growing up watching him play. Carl Robinson, who was great for me and sort of throughout the, the years that he was there. So it was just a, a good sort of um, mix at the time. Then the legs started getting a little bit older and it was always my dream <laughs> to play for Cambridge United. So that was what I initiated and managed to to finish my career at my, at my hometown club at the Abbey Stadium. You did indeed. And that was your homecoming in 2014-15. And you played, uh, this is a nice little story actually, you played a, a part in Cambridge United's run in the FA Cup in 2014-15, uh, when in the fourth round against your former club, Manchester United. You played in a goalless home draw, then a 3-0 replay loss on your return to Old Trafford. But of course, both sets of fans gave you a standing ovation at Old Trafford when you were substituted later in the game. Um, this must be quite emotional too, Luke, mustn't it really? It, it was an incredible feeling. One of them sort of feelings where the, the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. It was actually yeah. the first time that I'd ever been back to Old Trafford as a player. Throughout my time at the other clubs, I've never played against Manchester United, either home or away. So when we drew them in the FA Cup, I remember watching the draw on BBC One with my <laughs> wife and kids. And when it came out, Cambridge United v Manchester United, it was unbelievable. And then to, to actually get a draw against Man United at the Abbey Stadium was amazing. Yes. We went back to Old Trafford and I thought it was going to be sort of Royal Rovers stuff. I'd scored mm. a winning goal and sort of be the hero. <laughs> but on the on the night, I didn't, well, obviously Manchester United were far and away the better team and won the game comfortably. I got subbed off after about an hour after a pretty ineffective, ineffective performance. But I didn't even know if the fans would remember who I was. I'd only been sort of a bit part player over not long a period at all. But uh, to hear that ovation was something that I'll I'll certainly never yes. ever forget. It actually was it, it actually turned out to be the last professional game of football that I ever started. So it's quite a nice story to to sort of tell now. Absolutely. It's a wonderful story. And uh, to be remembered by the Manchester United fans as well for the time you were at the club, because obviously you were obviously there for a long time. That's incredible, isn't it? That's an amazing, amazing, amazing story to have. And you 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 keep for the rest of your life, your last game, walking off of Old Trafford, you know, in a, a game in the FA Cup for Cambridge United. Brilliant. What a story. It That's Royal the Rovers anyway, isn't it, really? It's a Royal the Rovers story. Yeah, it's something that I'll, I'll certainly never, ever forget. And something I'm Absolutely. Again, very, very grateful. There's so many great moments throughout my career that, that they're, they're memories, they're che- very cherished memories. And we're going to come on to your, your next part of your cherished career as well shortly. But before we do, you also made 13 appearances for England under 21s. Which you know, that's no mean feat. I mean, how did the England under twenty one set up compare to the domestic game in, in in the world of Luke Chadwick? Yeah, I think it like I was um, as a I was done really well in my YTS and got asked to go to the England under eighteen trials and I done really well and probably the the manager that rated me most or was the biggest fan of mine throughout my career was probably Howard Wilkinson who really. Oh, wow seemed to like me. He was the England under-18s manager at the time and then got the under-21s job. So he actually selected me for England under-21s before I was even in the Manchester United first-team squad. So I think it was quite... It raised a few eyebrows that I was in this squad with the likes of Frank Lampard, Jamie Carragher. I don't think really anyone knew who I was, but obviously it was a, a great honour to to represent my country and to play Absolutely. in some games for the England under-21s and still got the the England caps to this day. It probably at the time, again, not something that I that I enjoyed that much. I didn't really like sort of mixing. I was comfortable with my own peers at Manchester United, but weren't a great mixer and found it quite uncomfortable being with all these players from different clubs. But again, when I look back now, it's something that that you can tell people that you've you've represented your country, which is a, a great, great honour. Absolutely. No one can take that away from you, Luke, can they? You've been there, you've done it, you've seen it, and your professional career in football, you know, I have to say, it was a fantastic time. It really was. 
But of course, then upon retiring from professional football, you obtained all your coaching badges uh, whilst working in the Academy of Cambridge United Football Club. You did state at the time that while a role based at the elite level of football had some incredibly rewarding elements to it, you wanted to help and develop aspiring footballers further down the footballing pyramid and step out of the comfort zone that you had grown to be accustomed to as a professional footballer. Uh, this passion to help kids around the country to fall in love with the game led you to work alongside your former colleagues within the, the academy coaching set up, namely James Cutting, Johnny Martin, who, who co-founded the Football Fun Factory. And you haven't looked back since, have you, Luke? So what what did what so what do you do in your current role at the Football Fun Factory? It sounds incredible. Yeah, so I think like in terms of actually getting to the Football Fun Factory, when my football career came to an end. It was a, a really challenging time as it, as it is for, for many people that come out of a role that they've been doing for many years and sort of grown up doing. So I found that really hard and didn't really know what I wanted to do. So just can thought that all old footballers become football coaches, done all my <laughs> coaching qualifications and went into to work within the academy at Cambridge. Like you said there, there was good elements to the job, but I didn't I didn't love it. It wasn't something that I thought I'd be able to do for the rest of my life. It all just seemed a little bit too serious for for kids yes. at really young ages where it, it sort of turns into a job where they're training three times a week. And it becomes all about, for many anyway, all about the destination of becoming a professional footballer when in reality for few that actually happens. But the journey can be an incredible thing, but too often gets forgotten. So when James and Johnny spoke to me about the Football Fun Factory, it really captured my imagination and reminded me so much of what I spoke about earlier when I played yes. for Melbourne Tigers, my first ever team. And so I, I fell in love with the game because it was such a positive experience and the coaches made it so much fun. I can't remember them giving me any tactical or technical information, but I can remember they were always smiling and they always wanted you to, to enjoy your football. And without that, there's no way I would have had a career in professional football. So I wanted to, to be part of the Football Fun Factory. And that started with me being a head coach. So a franchisee, I ran the sessions in the area that I lived, the area that I grew up. One of the sessions was at the school that I went to and felt like I was sort of giving something back to the local community and trying to sort of help children fall in love with the game. And it wasn't, there was no pressure on the coach. You know, I wasn't trying to improve their left foot or to beat a low block or their Cruyff turn. It was all about <laughs> coaching for smiles. And probably most importantly of all, using football as a vehicle to, to develop positive life skills just as much Correct. as football skills. And as the, the business has, has grown hugely after the, over the past sort of three, four years, and now we're, sort of operating all over the country and have got huge ambition to to operate all over the world. And I've had to sort of step away from the coaching side of it, which I, I do miss, but sort of the bigger picture of trying to, at the moment, there's tens of thousands of children enjoying mm. the Football Fun Factory programmes and play a part to, to turn that into hundreds and thousands and millions of children just in enjoying the game in its, its purest possible form. Absolutely. And follow up for what I see and read as well about the Football Fun Factory. It's an incredible, incredible setup, uh, which you must be, a, a, you know, very proud to be part of. Absolutely amazing. And I, I think it's brilliant. And, you know, to make that one of the world's greatest academies almost for youngsters to grow up with football, it's, it's got to be a real pride thing, isn't it? It's sensational. It really has. And of course, normal isn't a thing in sport, is it, Luke? You know, so what does an average week look like for you now at the Football Fun Factory? You do many things there, I know. We were talking about it earlier on before we started the show. Yeah, so th so these days I'm sort of more office-based, so I'm not yes. well, I'm in my suit tonight, but often you can see me in my sort of smart clothes and sort of <laughs> meeting. You know, we've got a, over 80 head coaches now, so I engage with them and sort of keep keep the relationship, try and build a relationship. I speak to, to coaches that are coming on board as we continue to grow. I speak to a number of coaches in different countries at this exciting next step of our development of mm. overseas. So it's, it is um, incredibly exciting. Very different from being a professional footballer where you're sort of out on the training pitch working hard every day. But I think a, 
a huge amount of the lessons, particularly that I learned at Manchester United, have stood me in really good stead, sort of in a, a business sense now, more so than a, a football sense. Yeah, they certainly have, I'm sure. And as it's cold outside now, of course, nice to be inside, isn't it? With your suit on, doing the admin, not outside in the freezing cold weather. So a, a winter's <laughs> a time where I don't um, don't miss the coach. And it's summer Absolutely. when I get a bit of itchy feet and want to get back out there. Yeah, that's a very smart move, Luke. A very smart <laughs> move. And when, when did you know? I think you kind of almost intimated this already. But when did you when did you know you wanted to work in sport after a professional career in football? And the thrill, of course, of working with the Football Fun Factory. Yeah, again, it was more sort of not having a plan. I think one of my biggest regrets in football was never planning for the end and never wanting to admit to myself that my football career was was coming to an end because it just scared me so much. And it probably yes. took me three, three years until after my career that I'd really come to terms with the fact that I, that I wasn't a footballer anymore. I think that during that time, I lost a huge amount of identity of where I sort of sat in the world, lost a huge amount of confidence of not knowing or not believing that I could do anything else and sort of probably taint, tainted my experience of working in professional football. And I think the Football Fun Factory is, we're using football more than anything else to, yes. to develop lives, to develop life skills, to Im improve the life skills of children. And there's nothing more rewarding than doing that because children are, the future without sounding too too corny and if we can sort of give them a positive experience and what is such a huge responsibility to to our coaches is on so many occasions they are the first football coach of these kids in their first steps into the game and absolutely to be to be remembered I still remember my first football coach their names were Colin and Martin and I remember <laughs> them because they gave me such a, a positive experience and there's no mm. greater feeling for our coaches to to develop these kids and them to to have a lifelong love for football when they're old like me that they still love it and the reason I still love it is because of those positive first experiences and now it's our coaches that are giving them positive first experiences like and that makes makes all of us so proud of course and of course your your first coach is Colin and is it Stuart uh, they they gave up their time for nothing. They gave up their private time to give you the experiences uh, that you, you've you now inherited and, and provided back to the Football Fun Factory. I mean, that's that's lovely, isn't it? Well, it's gone yeah. a full circle. Why not, indeed? 100%. And then there is sort of Colin and Martin gave up their time because they wanted to, to help children, to support them, to, to have an experience yes. in football. And that, to this day, there's so many people that give up their time and sort of deliver grassroots football to to help children and that that's what we want to we want to support that and sort of give it every child the opportunity to play regardless of their ability level regardless of whether they're male or female we just want everyone to have the opportunity to to play and enjoy football Quite right, too. And what are you excited about now, Luke, with the Football Fun Factory as we move into 2024? There's obviously other plans, a wider field plans, you know, outside of the UK, I suspect. And what, what is what is the, the plans now for 2024 and beyond? Yeah, so we've got exciting. a couple. It is incredibly exciting, incredibly busy, but I'm not complaining about that. But it is a, <laughs> like we are sort of very close to sort of some big announcements around sort of the Football Fun Factory launching overseas. This month in January, we've had our first head coach launch in Republic of Ireland, which is quite a, a soft overseas launch because it's not too far away, but that was sort of fantastic for us. And he's a wonderful, wonderful coach and man. So many brilliant people have joined our teams and they come from all different walks of life. We've got people that have been school teachers, people that have been sort of bankers, worked in the city, people that have been builders. But what brings everyone together is that sort of love of football coaching, but more importantly, the love of child development. So probably the most exciting thing for me is to see even more of them people come on board and put their trust in us and for us to, to kickstart them on their journey to, to earn a living doing something that they, that they love doing. 
Absolutely right. And if you could change one thing about football, I mean, what would you change? I mean, I'm sure VAR comes into mind too. It does most people these days in football, doesn't it? So how do you teach VAR or VAR to the children at the Football Fun Factory? I know it's all about life skills and everything else and using football, but VAR is quite a quite a subject right now, isn't it? I'm sure it's on the tongue of the, the young children too. There must be questions as the methods, training and understanding affects play in the modern game as we know today, doesn't it, Luke? Uh, yeah. We're aware of it. It is. Um, everyone's aware of it, aren't they? I think the kids they are. About it. I think we make um, sort of a bit of a fun about it. At, um, football fun factory within the sessions about talking yeah. about bar. I think it, like, it is... It is here to stay. I can't see. I don't foresee it going anywhere soon. I understand sort of everyone's frustration where it does at times ruin the experience of a fan in a stadium when it takes them five, six minutes to make a decision. But I think in terms of grassroots football, kids football, it's never going to be there. And I think no, it not. is the case of them just enjoying the game. And if they ever get to that level, it means they've done incredibly well if there's VAR going on. But I think in terms of what how we deal with it at the Football Fun Factory is how you'd probably suggest, as the name suggests, in a fun, enthusiastic way. Absolutely right. I mean, how do people get involved with the Football Fun Factory? I mean, not just the children, the football players, you know, uh, but the budding coaches too. What do they do? How do they get in touch with you to um, launch their, their interest in becoming part of the Football Fun Factory? Yeah, so for, in terms of for parents, for their children to sort of sign their children up, we have a three-week free trial. So it's a case of parents, it's not, it's, we try and do it very differently to how yeah. trials usually are. It's us that's on trial, our coaches are on trial, and the children see if they think that they're going to enjoy sort of training under them. So that's how we sort of do that. If you go on our website, thefootballfunfactory.co.uk, you can type in your postcode and that will bring up the sort of closest sessions to you in terms of for coaches that are interested in sort of having a chat that would be sort of going on the website the same website and clicking on the franchising page there's a little form to fill out and then you will get a email sent through from yours truly and I will be sort of part of that discovery phase and sort of having a chat with you about our our opportunities Wonderful. What an exciting moment that is for the parents and, and the young players. That's incredible, isn't it? There you are. They'll they're be engaging with a former professional Premier League player for Manchester United. It doesn't get better than that, does it, Luke? I, I don't know stuff. about that, Lord Russell. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. It really is. Um, yeah, it's just, just, just incredible. I mean, what, what is the one piece of advice you would give to someone wanting to work in, in the sports industry these days, Luke? It's think... changed a lot, hasn't it? Yeah, it's um, an incredibly tough industry to get in, particularly football coaching, where what sort of a massive driver behind the Football Fun Factory was to give coaches the opportunity to earn a really good living doing something they love. And in my experience, working even in one of them few jobs within professional football, it is incredibly demanding in terms of hours and the sort of the the pay that you get for it usually isn't great. So I think in terms of working in a, a sport environment, I think obviously experiences in anything is the most important thing and getting as much experience as possible. Then it's sort of finding what what the right path is for you. I think I went down the the development route and it was all about trying to help kids be, become professional players, but mm. I realised quickly that wasn't right for me and it's more the the enjoyable sort of kids just having fun playing is where where I was at. So I think sort of getting experience and understanding what route you want to take. Absolutely. And of course, for the children too, it's just, it, as you said earlier on, it's not just about the sport itself, it's life skills too, you know, engaging with people, being part of a team, knowing how to win, how to lose, all these wonderful skills that you need in life to succeed anywhere in business and personal life is driven through sport, isn't it? So it's a wonderful thing, really. Yeah, and so many lessons can be taught. I think in like from sort of our sessions, any sessions in football in general, the, the social outcomes are so more important than the football yes. outcomes. Like the, the, the sort of stats are that 0.012% of kids that start playing will become a professional player in the Premier League. So there yes. has to be more to it than just that there has to be more outcomes which there are and I think when we really focus in on them outcomes them social psychological outcomes so much good can be given 
got got sorry from playing football yes. and sport in general. I quite agree, and of course, sport as uh, you know, as we know, uh, not just football, all sports really, uh, is a hectic industry. And what do you do personally to switch off? You know, when you come out of the football fun factory, you go home. How do you switch off? Because you must still be buzzing, still in there in your mind. Yeah, I think tomorrow. In terms of sort of switching off, I think I was guilty of not doing that enough when it sort of was just work, 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 and sort of <laughs> you, you, you get close to sort of burning yourself out. I oh, think, we've yeah, all been there, Luke. We've all been there. <laughs> I, I, I sort of try and keep myself fit, exercise, sort of do some running, that sort of thing. I, I, I struggle to get away from it. Both my children are involved in football. One of them's 20 and the other's 18. So I think it is still football, football, football. I think it's my wife that I feel sorry for because the house is just oh. football all the time. Bless her, bless her. Because yeah. <laughs> I think the wives and girlfriends often do suffer, don't they, a little bit. But do you have do you have time for any other interests outside of sport in your uh, in your life, Luke? You know, moving away from the football fun factory a little bit. Is there anything else you, you enjoy in life? Yeah, so I, I enjoy time with my family, really, sort of going to the shops. Yeah sort of traveling going away at the the weekends and that sort of thing so it's probably the things that that I couldn't do as much as a professional footballer now that my career is over and sort of making the most of that time but most of that would be sort of family and orientated where I've got the opportunity where a lot of the time as a footballer you're here there and everywhere and can miss out on certain moments so I'm trying to sort of make up for that now and making the most <laughs> of the time with the family Wonderful and good for you. And I hope that continues. And as you can probably no doubt understand, we've over, we're over the hour. Can you believe that, Luke? Really? An hour is just gone. It feels like 10 minutes, but it's, you know, a whole hour. I've kept my eye on the clock as I do, because you've got to keep a, a level head with these things. But we're over the hour. It's just incredible, isn't it? It does. Well, time. It's been an amazing show. And because as always on the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show, uh, we could talk forever, Luke, about your life as a top professional football player, and, of course, your continued interest in football, particularly at the Football Fun Factory. What an amazing place that is. So thank you, Luke, for coming on to the show and talking about your professional life in football. It's been a huge pleasure, and as always, uh, the pleasure is all mine. And, of course, the show's audience, when this podcast is released on the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show and the new YouTube channel too. So thank you, Luke. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you, Luke Chadwick, a big round of applause. <laughs> As thank I you very much. Been a, my microphone. Thank you, Lord Russell. It's been um, a pleasure talking to you today. Uh, it's been a huge pleasure to me. I mean, your life is so interesting. And, uh, you know, uh, stay on, Luke, just very briefly. Have a quick chat afterwards. I'll just wrap up the show um, and introduce the next guest who you'll know very well. Um, so um, stay on, if you don't mind, just for a couple of minutes. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, no worries. So the next episode on the World of Lord Russell podcast talk show is Regrets of a Football Maverick, where my special guest will be Terry Curran, the former professional football player whose career lasted from 1975 to 1988. Terry Curran was a stylish attacking midfielder who could also play as a winger and as an out-and-out out striker too. During Terry's 13-year career, he played for many clubs, although he is known by Sheffield Wednesday supporters for his part in launching the club's revival during the late 1970s and early 1980s. Terry is also an author and the best known for his autobiography, Regrets of a Football Maverick, the title of this show, which we will record in two weeks' time. The show will also talk about how Terry played for both Sheffield Wednesday and Sheffield United. That's no mean feat, I can assure you. Plus, of course, Terry's relationship with some of the biggest management names at the time, which will include Brian Clough, Jack Charlton, Tommy Doherty and Howard Kendall. Such huge managerial names they are. The show itself, uh, the show's title itself is telling with the immediate suggestion that looking back on Terry Curran's career and life has influenced Terry Curran to reflect and question some of the things he did, given that during Terry's playing career, he was a forthright and confident individual. A player, a man, certainly not afraid to say his piece, a true footballing legend and talent. And of course, I'm looking forward to seeing you all on the inside. So until then, it's au revoir from him and au revoir from me.